Hi, welcome to Yuskogans, the International Law Podcast. This is episode 13. And today we have with us uh, Bruno Jelena Fonchet. Uh, my French skills are put to test every now and then. I don't know why. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge and an adjunct lecturer at the University of Montreal. Uh, his research focuses on the content and implementation of state responsibility towards non-state actors. Uh, but today we are going to talk about the ICJ, the International Code of Justice. Uh, and Bruno recently wrote a piece called Election Season at the ICJ, Dawn of a New Era on Opinion Virus. Uh, and uh, before we get started on the details of the article, Bruno, if you can just give us a brief overview of the International Court of Justice. Uh, how many judges uh, does it have? Uh, where do they come from? And what's the process for their election? So that our audience, although most of them are uh, lawyers or law students, but it would be good to have a general overview before we get started. Sure, and thanks for having me. Um, so by way of context, the ICJ is the principal judicial organ of uh, the United Nations. And uh, it's composed of 15 judges. So these are the are, are judges that are elected for a nine year uh, term. Of course, there can be more judges because these are, let's, let's call it the permanent judges. But if a state has a, um, a case against another state and doesn't have a judge of its nationality on the bench, then there's always the possibility of appointing ad hoc uh, judges of their nationality. So there's a possibility, let's say, two judges that do not have uh, judges of the national of the court have a case. There are 15 judges and then each of them can appoint an ad hoc judge. So that can bring the total to 17 judge. But uh, this is just by, by way of context to give you an idea that it's, it's a big institution. And also it's, it's important to uh, remember that the ICJ only hears interstate cases. So it's very different from other international judicial institution located in The Hague. So, uh, unlike the ICC, it doesn't hear uh, cases of individual criminal responsibility, only state actions. Um, and what's, what's unique about the ICJ is that it's the only universal court. So all uh, states that are member to the United Nation are ipso facto also uh, member to the statute of the International Court of Justice. And it's also the only court which has a general jurisdiction. So it can hear any uh, affairs uh, re regarding or related to any matter of international, whether it be genocide, maritime denotation, diplomatic immunity, so any case. And this is quite different from other tribunals, which are often quite specialized in one area, just like, for example, the tribunal, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea or the WTO. And so the ICJ is special in that regard in that it's, it's the UN judicial grant. It's, it's Compose a 15 judge, and it can hear any matter of international brought to it by uh, states. Yeah, so, so Bruno, thank you once again for joining us on the podcast and also writing that really brilliant piece about the upcoming elections of the ICJ. So, so just to begin with, maybe, can, we, can you elaborate upon perhaps the process of the elections at the ICJ and the fact that it's uniquely perhaps both political um, and legal in, in, a, in a strange sense, and, and maybe also comment upon perhaps the staggered nature of elections at the court and why that may be the case. Yeah, sure. And, and I think this will surprise many of the listeners that the election process is not simple. So the ICJ is an old institution and we have to remember that, you know, it was created in 1940, you know, with, with the, 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 the UN Charter, but its predecessor is the Permanent Court of International Justice, which you know, dates back from the 1920s. So the, the mechanism for elections were crafted at that time in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're, they're, they might seem bizarre or not necessarily uh, you know, the most straightforward mechanism that you would devise today if you were to create a new court from scratch. And so the, the, the election process starts with the nomination phase. And I should say that there are 15 judges at the court but elections happen every three years for one third of the court. So the, the goal was essentially not to have a huge election where all 15 judges would be elected every nine years. It, it, the, the, the goal was to have a uh, you know, progressive renewal of the court. So every three years, five judges are up for re-election. And the election process starts with the nomination and the nominations are made by, are not made at the UN level, they're made by another institution which is called the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And this was created in 1899 and 1907 during the Hague Peace Conference. And the, the PCA has 
uh, gr national groups. So every country can nominate up to four people. And the goal of these people were that they would, they would form a roster of permanent arbitrators that you can call on at any moment to, to sit on an arbitration. But when the uh, PCIJ was created in the 1920s, people said, hey, we have this, this list of arbitrators. Maybe we can entrust them the role of nominating suitable candidates for election to the court. So these national groups are appointed by government. So for example, Canada, US, India, Australia, they will each appoint up to four uh, members of the PCA national group. And then this group will have the responsibility to nominate um, candidates to the International Court of Justice. There are a few rules regarding nomination. So the PCA national groups can only nominate up to four candidates, but they can nominate candidates not just from their own country. It, it's quite uh, frequent that uh, you know, a national group at the, at the PCA will nominate candidates from other uh, countries as well. And it's often a first sign or first step to gauge the support that the candidates have. Because after uh, the nomination period, which is usually, uh, you know, the, 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 the Secretary General of the United Nations will, will call on the PCA group to fill their name by a certain date. So this, this time around was June 24th. And when all the nominations are made and after June 24th, they're, they're made public, and then you can see, for example, which candidates have the support of which groups at the PCA. And some candidates will have 30 uh, national groups supporting their candidacy. Others will have three, four, I think five is the minimum uh, this time around. And so this process is, is the first step. And one thing I, it's important to, to note that is already kind of strange about this process is that it was devised so that the nomination would be less political. So by entrusting the role of nomination to the PCA group, the logic at the time in, in 1920, when the, the ancestor of the ICJ was created, the PCIJ, was, it, logic was like, well, if governments are the one nominating uh, candidates, it's, it's very political. But if this group of uh, highly qualified jurists at the PCA are the one responsible, then maybe we take the politics out of the nomination. But this is a theory, and in practice, it varies a lot between national groups. Some national groups are very uh, closely tied to their government. So the government will tell the, the member of the national groups, I want you to nominate X candidate, and the national group will do so. Other national groups are more independent, and it might do their own internal process to see which candidate they want to nominate, and so on. So it varies greatly across national groups, but uh, we can say that the the idea behind you know having this non political group doing the nomination is not really playing out in practice as it was envisaged originally. Yeah, yeah I, just had, I just had a quick question about the politicization of the whole process. So, do you think this is then inherent to the process itself on account of, for instance, Article Nine of the statute of the ICJ statute? I. I, I yes, I, to be honest, I think it, it would be very hard, and I think not really realistic to say that this whole process could be made without any political factor whatsoever. I mean, I think there, I think it was a good idea originally to try to lessen this, this risk by having this intermediate, intermediary. And you could say that it has some impact in some countries, but I think it's, it's especially for states that have uh, very uh, strong foreign policy objectives and so on. I think it's, it's, unrealistic to say that you can take out the, the politics out of it and there will always be a political factor and I mean it's not unique to the ICJ every there are many many elections at the at the UN level and, and uh, we can talk about this afterwards and there's a lot of parallels to be drawn with the ICJ but politics is always a factor uh, in these in these election and it might be particularly striking for listeners to realize the extent to which it, the, the political aspect is, is present. Not so much, I would say, the nomination process, but then it, it allows me to, to transition to the, the second step, which after the nominations are, are published, usually in June for an election to be held in, in uh, November this year, then it's the campaigning phase. So what does that mean? Well, it's, it's strange to think about it, but uh, you have different ways where judge, uh, judge candidates, I should say, are trying to put themselves forward and gain the support of other countries. 
and there are two ways essentially that this is uh, done. So first, the, the candidates themselves will oftentimes simply put forward their credential as very experienced or very knowledgeable people. And so they won't engage in what I will refer to as horse trading, saying, you know, if, if you vote for me, I'll, I'll, I'll rule on that or I'll, I'll take this position at the court. This, I mean, this is not uh, the case. But then the home states of these candidates will engage in a lot of uh, political campaigning. And this is, I would call it the ugly truth behind ICJ election is that let's say, you know, we're talking about the election right now. So you have, uh, we'll come back to the candidates later, I think, but you know, China, um, uh, you have uh, Uganda, you have uh, Nigeria. So all the states, the home states will at the UN try to contact other states and then they will engage in uh, trading. Oftentimes it's, you know, it's as simple as you vote for my candidate at the ICJ and I'll vote for your candidate at the WTO or I'll vote for you at the next Security Council election. So very, very pure and simple political horse trading. And this is circling back to your question, the, the very ugly truth of the political aspect where the the credentials of the judges themselves will often take a back seat and this diplomatic exchange of votes will, will, will be at the front and center of, of the process. And the reason why I think it's striking is that imagine that playing out at the domestic level. So first of all, the election of judges is not something very frequent that we see in many countries, but the US is perhaps the most well-known example where many judges are indeed elected through a, a popular vote. But when they campaign, they'll campaign on things such as, you know, their, their records regarding conviction of, of or criminals and whatnot, or their, the fact that they're stiff on, on, on criminal. But you never see these candidates, or you never see the campaign manager of these candidates saying, well, if you vote for my candidate, I'll, I'll, I'll do this for you, I'll do X, Y, Z. But at the international level, this is, this is what we have. We have to think about this, and you bring it to the domestic level, it's really, uh, strange as a process where you have these these states campaigning to have their judges elected by exchanging favors exchanging polit or doing political compromises essentially and, and really quickly before my colleagues also jump in bruno you you bring up a very very interesting point about how states and, and home states are so directly involved in the whole election process but but when you think about it at least from a from a practitioner's point of view or our general understanding of international law is concerned the the aim of the election procedure is to produce a judicial body of independent members as opposed to the state representatives. Um, but, but in practice, though, it seems like it's in, entirely diametrically opposed to what's, what's happening on the ground. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so the, the ICJ statute says clearly that the, the judges are elected in their personal capacity and are not representative of their states. And so this is quite different at the ICJ. Let's say you have the judicial election or you, you're electing somebody in its personal capacity versus political um, elections where you're voting for a state, for example, to sit on the Security Council or the, or the Human Rights Council. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that there, there's good scholarship out there where they, they, you know, the, there's a book about ICJ and ICC election by a collective of, of authors where they have actually interviewed diplomats at um, the UN. And, and the bottom line is that these diplomats do not make a difference whatsoever between judicial elections and political elections. They treat it the same and they, they engage in the same horse trading political exchange of favors that they would do in a political election where you might, you might think it's more appropriate there because you're running, our country is running to ha have a position where it can influence uh, UN actions. But, but the same practices apply to the ICJ where I think, and many people think it's less appropriate. And uh, we don't see as much what we should be seeing, which is the individual uh, uh, qualities or skills, competences of the, the judges. So if I could just uh, interject here. So, I, uh, so we left the process of selection, or rather the election midway. So maybe if you can just... Uh, finish it up in, in terms of how it looks like in the UN General Assembly and then the UN Security Council. And then maybe we can proceed to the 2020 elections, which is sort of the crux of the discussion. 
Sure, and sorry, I got I got sidetracked because you can see I'm really passionate about this campaigning aspect. But uh, that was essentially, my, my personal, about... I think I, I misled you with the question as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, you know, we talked about the the first two phases. So the first is nomination. So how do you get your name on the ballot? The second is campaigning. So once you're on the ballot, you know, how do you get support from other states? The third is the actual voting, and as we said, it happens every uh, every three years. And the voting is also quite particular because for candidates to be elected, they must be elected by both the General Assembly of the United Nations and the Security Council. So every three years in, in early October or, or you know, end of October, early November, they uh, both organs will meet concurrently. So at the same time, they'll proceed to their own voting simultaneously, but separately. And to be elected, a judge must have the absolute majority in both organs. So uh, there are 15 members on the, on the Security Council. So uh, a judge needs eight votes on the Security Council to have an absolute majority in there. But that same judge also needs concurrently an absolute majority in the Security Council. And there are currently 193 members. Uh, so that means 97 uh, votes. So to be elected, the five judges that will be elected this time around are those that can win a majority in both these organs. And what's interesting about this, this process is that it often, it, it's often the case that a judge might have very big support in the General Assembly, but not in the Security Council, and is going against a judge who conversely will have very big support in the Security Council, but not in the General Assembly. So what happens then is that if both organs are not able to come up with five names, they don't agree on the same five names, then there's a second meeting. So for example, uh, last time in 2017, both organs, uh, the, so when I say both organs, it's Security Council and General Assembly, they met, they had a meeting, which is a technical term in the, the ICJ statute, and a meeting has several rounds of voting. So they vote one, two, three, four, up to you know, seven times. And if they don't come up with the same five names, then they might adjourn for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, even a couple of months in one case uh, in the history of, of uh, the elections. Then there's a second meeting and they will restart the process. And you can imagine that in the meantime, there's a lot of uh, you know, diplomatic exchange and, and uh, campaigning. At that second meeting, again, they'll be voting by both organ. And if they cannot agree, same thing will happen. They will adjourn. And then a third meeting might happen. And what's interesting is after this third meeting, if there are no consensus between the Security Council and the General Assembly, then the ICJ statute provides a mechanism to resolve the deadlock. And that, that mechanism is a joint conference. So this is very reminiscent for, for listeners or people who have a, a country with a bicameral system of a parliamentary system where you have two two chambers essentially so in the uk you have the house of commons and the lords in the us you have the congress and the senate if both organs cannot um, uh, come to a compromise they might actually elect a small group of representatives so three from each and then this this joint conference tries to come up with a name of a, of a candidate uh, to resolve the deadlock and there's even a further procedure if this small joint conference of both uh, organs cannot resolve the deadlock then this has never happened, but it's provided in the statute. It would be up to the judges themselves at, already at the court to elect the member or the members that they deem uh, would best fulfill the function to fill the, the empty seats at the court. Uh, if we can just talk a little bit about this current season uh, of 2020, given how the pandemic is shaping out, how has that affected the campaigning part of the election? And after that, you can, you know, we can look at the individual candidates themselves, where do they come from and how many of them are standing for re-election. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, one of the many, many, many things that have been uh, affected by COVID-19. But of course, that means that campaigning oftentimes is like diplomatic, um, you know, practice. It's done in person, you know, it's, it's, it's dinners, conferences, cocktails, where you have, uh, you know, handshakes and people meeting, trying to put the, the, their candidates forward. And that has changed with COVID-19. So it's very interesting because for the first time, we have actually a glimpse of what campaigning looks like because of COVID-19. So uh, 
I think a, a month and a half ago, there was the, the um, uh, candidates from the Rwanda where they, they posted on Twitter a screenshot of their campaigning on Zoom where they were talking to the Georgian ambassador. And the tweet was something along the lines of, uh, great to present our candidate to the Georgian ambassador to the UN, looking forward to the ICJ election. And for me, this was kind of a sign of a new age where it's, it's campaigning, uh, you know, diplomatic practice in the age of COVID where you do it over Zoom like, like we're doing and not necessarily in person in the, in the hallways of, of New York. And this has, uh, I think, shaped the, the, the practice of, of uh, campaigning quite a lot. I should say, and I mentioned campaigning, there, there are two ways that uh, judges and states will campaign. The biggest one is in New York uh, with the permanent representative of, of each state uh, to the UN, because these are, I mean, these are the people voting. But oftentimes when, especially with states that have a very, um, you know, a powerful a machine behind their candidates, it might be that their judge will travel to the capitals where some of the foreign policy decisions are made. And so you have, you know, judges traveling to, uh, uh, you know, Pacific or, or uh, you know, the uh, uh, South America, Asia and so on. And of course, this is also not uh, possible. And so I think that the, the, the situation has affected uh, the, the campaigning as, as it affected everything else, really. So moving on to the specific candidates. So we, we see that currently we have eight candidates. So my question one is, is this the normal occurrence? Do we normally see eight candidates being sort of pushed for election? And then uh, sort of a follow-up question is that, is there a possibility of additional candidates being added, at least in theory? So I would say eight, eight candidates is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a regular number. It's, it's a, you know, oftentimes it's very rare to have uncontested elections. They, they will often almost always be a, you know, a contender for, for the seats. Um, it is impossible, although I, I shouldn't say this, there's one exception, but after the period for nomination has closed, so the secretary general has given the PCA groups until June 24th to nominate candidates, then the list is circulated. And after that, that point, it is no longer possible to add a candidate on the list. However, that, that doesn't mean that there are no surprises uh, left because states can redraw candidates from the list. And this has happened because uh, it might be that uh, there are some, that there's some uh, deals happening, political deals happening, which involve a state uh, redrawing a candidate to effectively open the way to, to another candidate. So this might happen. You might have names that are taken off. And also the, the reason why I was hesitant in your question is the only way you can add a candidate past this point is if you reach the level that I mentioned earlier where you have a joint conference. So this has only happened once in the history of both the combined history of the PCIJ and the ICJ. It has only happened, happened once in 1921. But in that precise case, the joint conference can nominate somebody outside of the original list of candidates. They can go out of their way and, and bring in somebody who nobody had thought of because they, the, the goal there is to resolve the deadlock. So that would be the only way where you could see a new name on the list, which if I'm being honest, it's quite unlikely um, that, that we see. But if I turn to the, the eight candidates that we have and, and one, um, very important characteristics to understand the, the forces at play here in the election is that uh, the judges are elected or, you know, based on their, their skills and in international action, you know, Article 2 says that they must be uh, recognized people with competence in international law. And this is their personal um, uh, competence. But the ICJ statute also talks at Article 9 of having a body as a whole, so the court as a whole, that is representative of the main form of civilization and legal system in the world. And that is a fancy way of saying that you need uh, um, uh, geographic representation, uh, equitable geographic representation. So you can't have, you know, 15 judges from the U.S. because this is the world court. You know, it hears cases from all over, so you want a body that is diverse. And this requirement in the statute has been operationalized uh, with a practice 
that consists of having a seat allocation that is similar to the 15 members of the Security Council. So 15 members on the, the Security Council, just like 15 judges at the ICJ. And the practice with the Security Council was to have three seats for Africa, three seats for Asia and the Pacific, two seats for Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, sorry, and two seats for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and five seats for Western Europe and others, which is most commonly known by the horrible acronym WAOG. Um, and so when states are voting in the General Assembly and the Security Council, they have to keep this represent, geographical representation in mind uh, so that the, the body as a whole will have members or will, will uh, abide by this, this uh, allocation. This is one practice in the election. And the other one is that up until 2017, so three years ago, the five permanent member members of the Security Council also had a seat at the ICJ. I don't want to say reserve, but it was the practice, the tradition that the, you know, so China, US, Russia, France, and UK always had a judge on the ICJ. Uh, and this was the, the tradition, the practice, except for a short period where China, because of, uh, you know, the, the political situation, essentially with, with uh, Taiwan and, and mainland China had a there's a hiatus, but I think after 1984, this tradition has been uh, continued. And so this was the situation in 2017 when there was a dramatic change in this practice. And if I can talk a little bit about it, uh, this, this is a, actually what, what pushed me to write this piece because uh, it, at the time, you know, ICJ elections are relatively uneventful there you know it's it's behind closed doors so we don't really know what happens until the names are, are suddenly known and but this this was an exception 2017 we saw a dramatic runoff between india uh judge bandari and the uk uh, judge greenwood and so both were incumbents in the court running for re-election and what happened is that you know we talked about the geographic uh, uh regional groups India, everybody thought, was going against Lebanon, with uh, the, the contender being uh, Judge Salam. And Judge Salam won a majority in both the Security Council and, and the General Assembly. And India was then pushed out of the Asian seat. But actually, India then had enough vote to uh, contest the, the status of the UK. Uh, and then it became a runoff between the two, uh, the two candidates, and it was very dramatic. It went to a third meeting of votes. And then, you know, states started, uh, the UK was pushing for uh, perhaps a joint conference that I mentioned, but uh, that idea was, was shut down. India threatened to, uh, you know, pull out of the Commonwealth if, if this was triggered. And, and it was a very interesting and very tense moment up until uh, the moment where the UK decided to uh, withdraw the candidacy of, of Judge Greenwood, so thus paving the way to Judge Bandari. And the importance of this is reflected in both practices that I mentioned. The result was that Asia increased, Asia and the Pacific increased its presence in the court from three, its, its historic three judge to four, at the expense of Weog, which historically had five and was now down to four because the UK was losing its, its, its seat. And, and I mean, it was also dramatic because many people said that it reflected at the time the diminished status of the UK in the world. And I think there's, there's some truth to this, but from my point of view, it also reflected, I think, the rise of India as, as a uh, important diplomatic power uh, because that same year, it also succeeded in electing a judge at the ITLAS and just before that, uh, at the International Law Commission. And so you can see the, the new power dynamics playing the old traditional power, you can, you can call them, are perhaps uh, they're, they're, they're weaker, they're not as influential, and you, you have this new dynamic. And the interest is, how will this new dynamic play out in 2020, the, the new election three years later? Will we see the impacts of this shift and, and what will happen? Essentially? We saw that in 2017, the UK pulled out its uh, uh, candidate, but 
After that, the parliamentary committee will very strongly urge that this is important that we have a judge at the ICJ. So why do you think it is the case that the UK has now once again not nominated any of its judges? So maybe perhaps if you could give us your take on that. Yeah, for me, that, that's a very um, important uh, element because, I, I mean, and this is not something you notice, right? You, you look at the list of, of candidates this time around, you're like, oh, there's a, there's a German candidate and, and, you know, he's going maybe for the seat left vacant by the, the, the Judge Gaia, so the Italian candidates, and you're like, oh, this is all fine. But if you look at 2017, after the, the UK's defeat, the, the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee at the House of Commons did a, uh, you know, a report looking at what happened, because this, this was a major upset in the UK. And they said, I mean, there were multiple factors, uh, including the, the fact that the campaigning had not been as efficient as it should have been. Maybe, you know, the UK was kind of uh, expecting that things would go uh, as smoothly as it had always been the case and so on. But the, the, the important thing that the committee said is like, well, now that this has happened, we got to move swiftly to make sure that we have an, a, a UK judge at the next possible opportunity. And the, the report said this is a clear priority because not having a UK judge on the ICJ for the first time in its history is very damaging. And I'm, I'm quoting from memory, but very damaging to UK interests. So you have this, this report and based on that, you would expect that the government would, would act and would present or at least try to present a candidate at the next opportunity. But this next opportunity was this election, 2020. And it turns out that the UK did not present a candidate. So, I mean, there might be many factors to explain this. Uh, I, I see it personally as a sort of uh, disengagement from the UK uh, in relation to the court. But it might be, some people have speculated, but it's just a strategic move. Perhaps the UK is waiting for the next round in three years' time because it might be that, uh, you know, there will be two WAOG judges, one from the US and one from Australia, but it might be that the Australian judge, Judge Crawford, decides not to run for another term. And so it would be easier for the UK to simply be elected at, at that point. Um, it's also worth noting that the UK has focused on other fora. So it's currently running a very uh, hard campaign for the election of a uh, judge at the ICC. And it's also presenting a, we can call it a surprise candidate at the WTO uh, for the director general. So, I mean, it might be that the UK is disengaging from the ICJ, but pushing in other areas of, of, of interest. It can also be that the UK wasn't confident that it could actually win this seat because we have to remember that if in 2017 the UK was diminished by, for example, the Chagos uh, advisory opinion vote in the, in the uh, General Assembly, since then there has been an advisory opinion from the court clearly recognizing the unlawful behavior of the UK, but the UK has not accepted or has pushed back on that, on that opinion, saying it will essentially not uh, implement it, its its finding. And I mean, Brexit as well. It used to be that the UK could potentially, uh, you know, count on the support of, of the EU, but it's it's no longer the case, perhaps. So it might be that the UK was not confident that it could put it off and it didn't want to uh, suffer another humiliating blow by presenting a candidate at the next opportunity and losing twice in a row. Uh, Bruno, if you can just uh, talk about China for a second. Uh, we see that China is pu uh, pushing a candidate for re-election uh, and we already saw strong opposition from the US when China pushed for a candidate in Itros. Uh, so how does that pan out in the ICJ? Do you, do you, is, is a similar uh, situation happening uh, in the ICJ as well? Yeah, th that is very interesting for me because you can clearly see a very obvious contradiction in, in US foreign policy. So Judge Shui, who's the Chinese, current Chinese judge at the ICJ, she's the vice president as well uh, of the court, and she's running for re-election. So uh, we, 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 I mean, we didn't go through all the candidates, but there are eight candidates for five positions. So she's one of the four incumbents running for re-election. And what's interesting is we mentioned the process of nomination by national groups. And Judge Shui has been nominated, obviously, by her own country, but by other countries as well. 
including the U.S. So the U.S. national group at the PCA has explicitly endorsed and nominated Judge uh, Shui. And it should be said that, you know, I mentioned that the ambivalent status of PCA national groups, some are more independent, some are very just an extension of the government. The U.S. is interesting because it used to be that, you know, it has a reputation of being somewhat independent, but it is chaired by the current sitting um, legal advisor at the State Department, which is a political Trump appointee. So we could say that, you know, it, it, the endorsement of Judge Shui represents a at least somewhat semi-official endorsement of the Chinese candidate. And this is not surprising in itself because it used to be, or it is still the case, I should say, that there's a practice where Remember I said a few minutes earlier that the five permanent members of the Security Council always had a seat on the court up until the UK's defeat in 2017. Well, there was a practice in the nomination that whenever a candidate from the P5 was up for re-election, this candidate was always nominated by the other four uh, uh, P5 uh, uh, members. So a sort of pact to ensure their mutually, uh, their, 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 their presence, their mutual presence at the court. And so you see this and you say, well, it's just the U.S. continuing it, its practice of endorsing the other P5 members. But then, as you rightly pointed out, the, it, it's quite striking to contrast this event at the ICJ with what's happening at ITLAS. So another important tribunal where there's a current election campaign ongoing, uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And there, the State Department has actively campaign against the Chinese candidates running for election. And uh, the state, a uh, very senior state uh, department official went so far as to say that, you know, because of China's uh, rejection of the uh, South China Sea arbitration award or the way it, it behaves itself in the South China Sea, that electing a Chinese judge in Itlas would be like, you know, hiring an arsonist to run the fire department because essentially China would just, you know, be running around and trying to undo or, or, or you know, uh, push an interpretation of the law that would be favorable to its its otherwise unlawful claims in the South China Sea. So that, that's the kind of rhetoric that we see from the U.S. But the contradiction comes from the fact, and, and not, I don't know, not many people know this, but the United Convention on the Law of the Sea has a, has a, some people call it a buffet, but it's a wide array of dispute settlement mechanism. So parties to the convention, whenever there's a dispute between two states, can resort to three type of dispute settlement mechanism. They can go to ITLAS, which is a tribunal specifically created by the convention, but they can also go to arbitration, so ad hoc, outside of any forum. And the third uh, possibility is that they can go to the ICJ. So the ICJ is one of the four specifically provided as an option under the, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. So if the U.S. administration is worried that a Chinese candidate in ITLAS might be like hiring a, an arsonist to run the fire department, it's quite contradictory to then support the Chinese candidate at the ICJ because the same case could potentially end up at ITLAS or the ICJ depending on the party's choice. And arguably, the ICJ has made, a, I would say, a bigger contribution in the development of the law of the sea, particularly in the area of maritime delimitation. And of course, I mean, this is not the first nor the last contradiction of, of this particular U.S. administration, but it's, it's quite striking. And if I had to speculate as to the reason for this contradiction, I think I would say that uh, the U.S. is not a party to the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea for historical reason, the Senate's opposition, and so on. But it, it does say that it abides by the, the, the customary international that is reflected in the convention and whatnot. But it, the fact that it's campaigning, I mean, the, the repercussion will be minimal because China could never retaliate and campaign against a U.S. candidate at ITLAS because the U.S. doesn't, is not a party to UNCLOS, doesn't have a judge on ITLAS. But if the U.S. was to do the same thing at the ICJ and say, for example, don't elect this Chinese judge, well, in three years' time, when the U.S. will be uh, looking for re-election of its candidate, it might be that China could retaliate at the ICJ, and the U.S. might want to avoid this, this uh, retaliation in, in, uh, at the ICJ. 
And Bruno, just just quickly carry on carrying on this this uh, line of speculation. Do you also think that, at least in so far as the ICJ is concerned, that the United States is maybe quite similar to the United Kingdom wanting to disengage from the ICJ as an institution? Do do you think right. that may be a possibility as well? I mean, that's a good question because, I mean, Trump has pulled out of many UN institutions. I mean, the latest being the WHO, but I mean, of Trump, uh, the, the Trump administration and Pompeo, are, they're famously against a multilateral forum. And so I, you, you would think that the ICJ then is clearly fits within that, that vision that maybe it's not something that is useful or whatnot. The, the thing I would say, though, is that the, the, the U.S. judge, so Judge Dunyu, is not, uh, her mandate goes until uh, 2023. And so if, uh, the, depending on what happens in the next uh, U.S. presidential election, it might be that the, the new, a new administration is in place. And then this new administration uh, with Joe Biden would definitely want to keep a presence at the core. If Trump is reelected, then, then it's true that you might see, you know, less enthusiasm for this election process because they don't, you know, Trump doesn't see uh, the, the need or the usefulness of having a judge at the ICJ. But I still think that, you know, it's so entrenched in the, the practice, the ICJ, the, the, the U.S. would still present a candidate. But I'm not sure they would present Judge Donahue, uh, who was nominated under the Obama administration. I, I'm not sure she would have the support of a Trump administration if she was to run for re-election. And, and Bruno, is, is it also possible for you to expand a little bit upon now, moving away from the political aspects of things, uh, perhaps the, the gender representation of judges at the OECJ and how that has looked historically and how that looks going forward? I mean, uh, th this is a, a great question and it's a very problematic aspect of ICJ uh, election practice. So in the 100 year history of the court, and I'm combining here the PCIJ and the ICJ, in the 100 years, there's only ever been four female judges at the ICJ. Think about this, 100 years and only four. The first one in 1995 was actually a UK judge, uh, Dame Rosalind Higgins. And she, she uh, started her mandate and she eventually became, became president of uh, the ICJ. And it wasn't until 2010, 11, that you saw uh, the other uh, women judges. So. It was in, a, in, you know, after a very long absence in the, in the space of 18 months, because you had a by-election for the U.S. in the Chinese seat and then the, the regular election in 2011, you had three uh, women judge elected. So Judge Donahue from the U.S., Judge Shui from China, and Judge Sebutinde from uh, Uganda. And so uh, now uh, Judge Hagen has, has resigned uh, in 2000. Nine or, or has not uh, ha has left the court in 2009. So that, that leaves currently three uh, women judges. Uh, but this is particularly interesting for this election because there's one contender. So, so in the eight candidates, we can talk about an interesting race, which is happening for the Eastern Europe uh, group, where you have a longstanding contender, Judge Tomka from um, Slovakia, who is running for third term. So it's quite rare. You only have a handful of judges who have actually won uh, re-election for, th because remember, the terms are nine years. And so a third, so that's after two terms, that's 18 years. And a third one would be, if you finish it, 27 years, which is quite a long time on the court. But you have a Croatian contender. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Judge Sersic is uh, trying to claim the, the, the seat from uh, for the Eastern Europe group. And there, the interest is that the campaign, the Croatia's campaign, when you look at their material, their, their, their website, they're pushing explicitly the gender diversity aspect. So the ICJ election has always been about geographical diversity, but, but Croatia is saying, hey, wait a minute, we need more gender balance on the court. And I think this will be a, a big aspect because of the, the, you know, the very appalling record of the ICJ on that front. And remember when we spoke at the very beginning, you know, I said the ICJ election is a, little bit, is a little bit strange because it's from another era. When you look at more recent courts like the ICC, for example, and the Rome statute that was, you know, adopted in, in uh, uh, I mean, 
more a little bit more than 20 years ago, but there the statute explicitly provides for gender diversity as one of the criteria that the, the, the states have to keep in mind when electing judges. So it's explicit, uh, which is something that you don't have at the ICJ, but that you see now in the campaigning strategy of states like Croatia. And what, what is interesting in that regard is that Croatia is putting that forward, but if you circle back to when I mentioned the election of Judge Donahue or Judge Shui, if you look at the press release from that time, it's not something that was put forward. You know, there was when I, I was rereading the, the press release from the State Department when, when Judge Donahue was uh, nominated, and, and it didn't mention the, the, the gender diversity issue. Well, uh, you know, the contrast is quite striking when you see the press release from Croatia today when this is the front and center of uh, the campaign. I believe you have an interesting fact about two, potentially two judges from the same family. What's, what's, uh, what's that about? Yeah, I, I, and, and this, um, I mean, it would be potentially the first time. So there, if I, if I bring it back uh, just to, we talked about Eastern Europe, China, and so on, but one of the other most interesting race in this uh, election uh, will be the African seat. So there's, one African seat up for grabs normally in this election, but there are three candidates running. Uh, there's the incumbent, Judge Tibutende from Rwanda. There's uh, a contender from uh, Nigeria, a very strong candidate who was the registrar, uh, registrar sorry, of the uh, residual mechanism. And then you have a judge from uh, Rwanda as well, Judge uh, Yugira Shebuja, who's currently a judge at the, at the uh, East African Court of Justice. And uh, it will be interesting to see because my, my one of the things I, I'm, I'm, I'm discussing in the post is that the 2017 election has shifted, you know, the, the traditions or have has uh, really opened up the door for new surprises. So while theoretically there's only one seat for Africa and the three African judges might be content, might be competing for this one seat, it could be that. Um, if Africa comes together as a voting block, you know, 54 state, that's the largest vote regional block in, in one election. If they push for two candidates, they could actually increase their presence and take the seat that Asia has taken in 2017 and increase their own presence from three to four judges. And if they do so, for example, if Judge Tibutende was reelected, the current judge, and uh, Dr. Elias from, from Nigeria was, was elected. The, the, the fun fact, I think, that uh, you know, has, has circulated on, on social media is that it would be the first time that a, two members of the same family would, be, uh, would have been elected at the ICJ because Dr. Elias' uh, father was also judge at the ICJ in the 1990s and was even president of the court. Uh, so this is one of the interesting uh, tidbits of information about the, this election that uh, that is running in the background as well. But I, I think that, I mean, the, the more interesting point, the broader point would be Africa's opportunity that they could seize. Of course, if they seize this opportunity, it would have to be at the expense of another group. And I'm, I'm thinking that, uh, for example, Asia uh, judge, judge Iwasawa, who's the Japanese judge running for re-election, uh, might be um, the one that would have to contend with this strong unified block from, from Africa. Uh, and it could, it could create an interesting dynamic uh, where we would continue to see this power shift that I, that I mentioned uh, that started in 2017. So just to move towards concluding the discussion. So if maybe you could just give us your final thoughts in terms of, and we've had this discussion before, but what, practical benefits do state get out of having their judge at the ICJ and maybe sort of whether this sort of shift in the tide and sort of this deviation from the regional grouping, whether you see this continuing and whether it will have a ripple effect and change the sort of the demographic, so to speak, of the ICJ uh, panel. Yeah, I, th this is uh, starting with your, the first part of your question. This is a very, uh, I would say, difficult question to answer. Like states often see the presence of one of their national on the bench as 
an asset for a situation where they have cases at the ICG. So India was running a very aggressive uh, campaign in 2017, and it was, you know, there was no secret that it was in part because it had a case against Pakistan, uh, the Jadav case, and it saw the presence of an Indian judge on the bench as an asset, even if, as we discussed, Pakistan had also had an ad hoc judges, uh, sorry, ad hoc judge uh, sitting on the bench. But there's this perceived benefit, and I want to say perceived because I mean it's very hard to prove that you can actually, you know, have concrete benefit from this. But it's it's definitely a matter of of uh, perception and also a, a matter of prestige. So it's it's you know states always want their their nationals to have the the highest offices uh, to, to occupy the, the highest offices at the UN. And so this is clearly um, a matter of geopolitical uh, strategy to to have uh, your nationals out there. It it, it brings um, it can bring benefits. It can bring prestige and so on. And uh, to, mean, to just to just to intervene a little bit, sorry. Uh, given that you have served as a judicial fellow at the ICJ, I'm sure you have a personal insight how to how things work there. So, do you see any politicization in terms of the decision making? I, I know this is a very loaded question, uh, but uh, <laughs> what do you have to say about that? This is why actually I'm glad that you asked because this is why I say perceive because from my experience, uh, obviously I, I I see the judges and I've I've seen the judges in action and. I can say personally that I, I think uh, the, the judges, once they're on the bench, tend to leave their you know, politics aside and, and they're, they're jurists, uh, first and foremost, and they will focus on the legal issues. And I mean, you, you can find some literature out there that will show you, for example, that judges of the nationality of a country in front of the court have voted against their home state in a number of cases. So it's not a given that, oh, you have a judge on the, on the court there you go, one vote for you. No, 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 there are examples. I mean, of course, statistically, sometimes the judges, or especially the, 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 the ad hoc judges will often vote with their, their countries and, and judges of the nationality, but it's not a given. And in my experience, I've seen really, once the election is, is done, once the judges are doing what they are uh, meant to do, which is you know being independent individuals, which is a, a requirement in the statute. Then I don't see this this influence playing out. But uh, you know it's very hard to prove or disprove because you would need empirical evidence, interviews, and this is something that's you know not not really discussed or readily available. Uh, uh, and, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 please finish, finish. I mean, I was just circling back to, to uh, the second part of the question is like, how, how do we see this playing out? And I think my, my last word would be on, on this is that this, this election will be one to watch, to watch because the 2017 election created kind of a, an earthquake, uh, you know, a, a, a seismic change, a power shift, uh, you know, Asia increasing its, its presence, the UK being ejected from the court. But this election is the first time that we can see the impacts of this change. So will it be kind of a one-off where India was very strong diplomatically that year and the UK was particularly weak and then we will see Asia keeping this fourth seat for the foreseeable future? Or will we see a more, uh, uh, you know, I would say, I would call it a more structural change where there will be more, less, you know, entrenched regional groups. Okay, you have three seats, so we have to elect an Asian, or you have four, you have three, and more of a uh, fluidity or flexibility in, in, in the election of judges. And perhaps this is good because it could lead to more focus on the actual candidates and their uh, profile, their skills, as opposed to more of the more kind of political side where it's, you know, how many of your voting bloc will support the candidates and so on. I think I'm being um, a little bit wishful, but, but, but I, I'm hoping that this will bring more flexibility and that this in turn might result in less politicization and more focus on the actual candidates. All right, perfect. That brings us to an end of the podcast. Uh, thank you so much, Bruno. Uh, it was wonderful to have you and I think uh, we had a great discussion. Uh, and I have a feeling that we'll be seeing more of you on the podcast. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> But Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm a, you know, in the U.S. they say uh, you're, you're a long-time listener, first-time caller. So that was me. I'm a big fan <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it was great to have you. And I am sure the audience would love this.
to uh, to see the discussion as well. Yep. So it was yeah, an absolute that, pleasure that, to have you, Bruno. It was it was just wonderful to have this discussion and about the elections as well. I think I think you know it's uh, you, not not too often you hear people getting excited about the ICJ elections. So I think twenty twenty is different in that <laughs> <laughs> regard.